Good morning. Jenny and Ellie, thank you so much for that reminder that even when we may give up on ourselves, or we can sometimes give up on our children or grandchildren, we think, oh, they're too far gone. They're just walking out of the light, away from Jesus. He never gives up on us. And I want to praise God for that this morning. Yesterday, we took some time to deploy to the mercy seat, didn't we? Some, a relationship, someone that it concerns us, a relationship that's heavy on our heart, a loved one, child, grandchild, brother, sister, parents that are just heavy on our hearts. And I pray, and we, my husband and I have continued praying, and we'll continue as we travel from camp meeting to camp meeting, we will continue deploying those loved ones to the heavenly mercy seat. But let me tell you, there's a whole lot that Jesus can do through us, through us, as we connect to that fountain of love, and we become syringes. Anybody medical in the field, medical, medical workers? When we become syringes of God's love in the life of all of those that God has put in our circle of influence, friends, miracles begin to happen because Amen. love Amen. is God's medicine. Amen. For a hurting Amen. world, for our hurting families, for our hurting children and grandchildren, and for our hurting neighbors, and for a planet that is just self-destructing. Love. Christ's love. Christ's love is the antidote, and relationships are the vehicle that God needs for us to inject other people with love, with his love. So relationships, relationships are very, very important to God. So today, this morning, we're going to start praying, but today's prayer is going to be focused on our children. So if you have a child, a son, a daughter, maybe a nephew, a niece, maybe the child of uh, a neighbor that you feel that you got to pray for this individual, we are asking you to please bring those names into your children mind. Children or grandchildren. Children or grandchildren nephews, that they need, are needing prayer specifically. They're needing a miracle. That's what we're praying for this uh, uh, morning. So as we pray, uh, please keep those names in mind. We'll and invite you to, should we invite them to stand okay. since they'll be sitting for a little bit. If you wouldn't mind joining us as we um, lift up our hearts, um, you're welcome to stand. If you're not able to do so, that is fine too. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be here this beautiful, uh, windy morning at camp meeting. And we just want to say thank you. Thank you for waking us up. Thank you for giving us the health and the wherewithal to make our way here today. And, oh, Holy Spirit, we invite you to enter all of the chambers of our hearts and our minds. May the voice, the still, sweet voice that we hear this morning be yours, speaking to our hearts individually, custom-made messages that each one of us needs in order to be able to be your instruments, your syringes of love to those hurting around us. There is a son, perhaps a daughter, niece, nephew, a grandchild that is needing prayers yes. right now. Yes. Perhaps they are discouraged. Perhaps they are going through a crisis. Perhaps they are experiencing anxiety, depression. Perhaps they are even considering ending their lives. Perhaps, Father, they are making a very tough decision. Perhaps they are in the moment where they need to choose a partner for life. Perhaps they are sick in a hospital. Perhaps they are losing a member of their body Perhaps they have been diagnosed with a terminal illness. Perhaps they don't feel loved. Perhaps they don't feel valued, accepted, 
respected. Perhaps they need Jesus. So we are praying for these children this morning, for these young men, women that need to find Jesus and need to know that Jesus does have a plan that is perfect for their lives. So draw closer to these individuals. You know who they are. You know who we are praying for. But there's a lot of names that are being lifted up this morning before your presence. And we are, again, going back to your promise. You said, come to the throne of grace and don't be uh, shy. Be bold because you're going to find grace and you're going to find help with the time of need. And, Father, this is the time where there is a child in this world, one of our ch children, that needs you. So we're asking for you to intervene in these young people's lives and hearts. And please, be quick. Don't take three days. Some of these young people don't have three days. They are, they are people that are considering ending their lives today. And we pray that you will find somebody that you can send as an representative of heaven and an angel yes. that will come and bring healing and hope to these individuals. Yes. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Our kids are never too old. Thank you so much. You may be seated. <laughs> so very quickly, uh, we're going to try to go uh, through um, a little extensive material. Hopefully we will finish today. Uh, so be patient with us. Yesterday, we started by saying that relationships are very important to God. We, I believe that we understood that, right? Uh, Jesus said, love me, love yourself, love uh, others, because that's basically the most important thing in my life and the most important thing in, in Christian living and religion so and So important church. that all of God's law <laughs> and all of the prophets is summarized in the three loves that God is inviting us to make a priority. And then John comes up saying, uh, says it in a more read, specific manner, read, very read this simple. With us. We know this verse. We learned it in kindergarten. But let's read it together this morning. By this, all well, people, people will, will know, know that, that you, you are, are my disciples. If you have love for one Another, friends, love is the litmus test. It's not what we know about God. It's not the doctrines that are beautiful. Our Adventist doctrines are the best out there. I am so happy and humbly, humble, I'm going to say humbly proud. Is that possible? Proud in a humble way that I'm a Seventh-day Adventist because we have a beautiful, complete, biblically-based gospel. But friends... Knowing that is not enough. The Word of God says they won't know our disciples because of our doctrines. They will know we are Christ's disciples because we've become his syringes. We have become love in our relationships. So this is God's plan. This is his strategy to love and go around being syringes of love, injecting people with love. God's That's love. God's plan. Yes. So we know that we have an enemy, right? The great controversy yes. between good and evil. So what does the enemy do? Well, he tries to destroy your ability to love. Simple. Exactly. We're supposed to love others. Then he says, aha. Uh -huh. So God sends you to love. So let me see what I can do to destroy your ability to love. To give love and to, and to receive, receive love. love. So what does he do? He goes into your heart. What is the heart of the human being, of the person? The heart of our hearts are basically right there in throne, embedded into our brain which is called the limbic, limbic system, system. Right in the middle part of our brain. And That's the limbic right. system basically is the center of emotions. This is why you use uh, well, this is what the brain basically triggers when you are supposed to respond to life, when you are supposed to respond to people, when you are to, supposed to respond to love. So by attacking this system, basically a system that you're supposed to use to love and have compassion, trust, to feel safe, and to experience peace, he basically comes into your life. Typically at an early age, continue. 
How early, Caroline de Leon? Well, it's interesting because you know the enemy has had just a few years under his belt of experience. So he understands sometimes better than we do as humans how important and impactful it is for him to come into the life of humans at their earliest stage of life, the first three years, the first four years and of life. And we're going to say something that you may have not thought about, but it is our understanding that Satan moved on you before you were even born. Even in utero. When you were in your mother's womb, guess who he was attacking? Your mother your father, so that they would create conditions, situations where you as a fetus would experience anxiety, stress. So you From started experiencing stress mm -hmm. when you, before you were born. born. That's right. And Satan was attacking you before you were born and making the life of your mother very miserable. It is my hypothesis that when our parents were young, Satan moved very strongly against them because he knew he wasn't only going to destroy a marriage, he was going to destroy a person. There was an embryo. There was a baby that was being shaped and formed. And as this baby is shaped and formed, this baby is listening, is hearing, is experiencing mother's anxiety, mother's uh, uh, depression, fear. Fear. mother's fear. Worries. So all this, my friends, is already attacking your limbic system. So some of us, before we were born, let me say this again in a different manner. By the time we were born, we were already affected by the, the enemy attacks. Our limbic system, our ability to love was already affected. Let me give you a, a, an illustration very quickly. When I am born, my mother is diagnosed with tuberculosis. If you know about tuberculosis, you know that it's very contagious, and people are moved very quickly from the major population, and they are isolated, isolated right? Quarantine, isolated. In this case, my mother, basically, I am born. She's uh, a couple of days or weeks before. I don't understand exactly how soon. Uh, but uh, she's diagnosed with tuberculosis, so the doctor said, the moment you have your baby, you cannot touch your baby. You got to leave. You got to leave your baby behind, and you got to go to a hospital to recovery. So I am born with no mother. <laughs> and I don't ask me when I saw my mother next. I don't know when she came back from the hospital. I do know that eventually my mother lost a lung as a result of her tuberculosis. So my mother lived most of her life with one lung. And ironically enough, she was a swimmer. So imagine a swimmer with one lung, but that was my mother. Secondly, my father leaves my home by the time I'm six months old. So no father, no mother, and one day I thought, wow, I was a, an orphan. I didn't think of me as an orphan because I had a mother. She came back, uh, but I lost a father. And, but that's how Satan was already working against me, destroying my ability to love. Everything is, was being affected, affecting the amygdala, the ability to have emotions, to experience emotions, to experience closeness, to say uh, loving words, to receive loving words. And this is happening quickly after I'm born and long before I was born. This is what Satan does with all of us. And the purpose of all this, Caroline, why is it that he's attacking us so deeply? Well, we said yesterday that perception, the way we perceive, is pretty much everything. So Satan needs to find a way to distort the way we perceive God, the way we perceive ourselves, and the way we perceive others. Because once he's distorted, by the way, that is exactly what happened in heaven, right? The war in heaven, the war that began in heaven, Satan found a way to distort the perception of one-third of the angels. He started spreading rumors about God's character. And that is how 
the mystery, the word of God calls it the mystery of iniquity, right? We don't know exactly how a, an angel created in a perfect manner by a loving God was able to be infected with sin and then quickly manipulated the minds and perception of the third of angels that believed his lies. And he continues Keep that in mind. using the distortion of perception in our lives. Keep that in mind because, unfortunately, some of us have gone through this process where Satan has been distorting our perceptions. We just don't know it. That's right. We just don't know it. And we call that self-deception. We think <laughs> we have perfectly clear perception, right? But everyone around us is like, no, your perception is not healthy. It's Sometimes not normal. our parents <laughs> or our siblings, they try to help us out, and we go, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. You're just uh, jealous <laughs> or envious, right? And then we get married. Oh, oh, mercy. And when we get married, what happens to our distortions? They come to light. They percolate to the top. God gives us a spouse that's very quick to point out where our perceptions are distorted. So we need to understand this because a lot of us have lost our relationships because our distortions. Perception. Perceptions, distorted perceptions. And Satan continues playing a game on us through our distorted perceptions. And if we don't stop to realize how distorted our perceptions are, we're going to die with distorted perceptions. Self-deceived. Self-deceived, right. right. About God, ourselves, and others. Yes. And yesterday we mentioned, and I don't want to dwell on in this point, but I mentioned to you that as pastors, we are having to bury individuals, unfortunately, that have been deceived. They think that, hey, I know my Daniel. I know my revelation. I know my, my, I know my, my, my theology. Yes, you do your theology, but in the area of, of relationships, they are flunking. Now, if I were to ask you, I, I wanted to save this for later, but I'm going to throw it today. If I were to ask you, what is the last test for us as Seventh-day Adventists, as Christians? The final test. What is it? Hmm? Anybody? Worship, yes. Worship? Okay, who else? Loyalty? Somebody said loyalty? Loyalty, yes. Okay. So anybody else? Speak up, but really. Love, love for one another. Ha, ha, you're very close. You're very close. Well, I would say that, that that's on the button. Okay. Because the word says that Jesus will Hold say. Hold on. I'm going to give that a, 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 a title first. Okay. The final test, besides being the Sabbath, I would say the final, the Sabbath is, is connected to worship and loyalty. So, but the Sabbath is not the final test. You know, when you graduate, and you go to school, you have to pass a final test, which basically, that's it. You pass it, and then if you approve, you're done. Sometimes right? comprehensive final test. Well, it's yes. interesting. My dear friend, Carlos, good to see you. It's interesting, Pastor Carlos, I should say pastor, right? The final test, check this out, has to do with relationships. Relationships to God, right? No. Loyalty, worship, and relationship yeah, and to others. Can somebody tell me what that test is? I'm giving you a hint. So I want you to think, process. What is the test? If the final test has to do with relationships, what's the final test? Love. You connected, yeah? Love. There is a, a chapter in the Bible. I'm going to give you, I'm going to be helping you. It's found in Matthew. Yes, it is. And it's towards the end, uh, books of Matthew. Chapters. I uh, see uh, between chapters. the 20th something. something. Anybody? Okay, here we go. Because we got to go. We got to move on. Listen. Relationships. The final test. I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you came and you dressed me. I was in prison and you came looking for me. To visit me. Relationships. So because you did all that, come, children of mine, and enter into the kingdom and rejoice in my Father's love. Isn't that something? 
Jesus is not going to ask you, even though it's wonderful and it's perfect and it's very important, Jesus is not going to ask you, explain to me Revelation chapter 13. That's not on the final test. <laughs> so who is the little horn? Very important. It's Very good important. to know. It's Very good important. to know. No, we're not knocking knowledge. Don't miss Jesus is going to ask you, how is it that you did relationships? How did you apply what you knew in your head and intellect to your actions and relationships with the people? We start with family first, with the people that I put under your roof, your children, your spouse, your in-laws, your neighbors, your community. How did all of that head knowledge translate into loving relationships with all of those people I put in your circle of influence? So here's the enemy. You are going to go to H-E-L-L -L with me. That's what he wants. He doesn't want to go down alone, that's He doesn't sure. want salvation for you, right? So God says, all right, your last test is going to be about relationships. Loving so, relationships. So the enemy says, I'm going to disconnect you from every single relationship, including your spouse and your children. Because I'm going to work against you and I'm going to take away your ability to love so that you will end in isolation. Yep. And isolation, my friends, is most what? It is our most anti-design state. The most injurious. Because we were designed, we've been saying since yesterday, we were, we were genetically programmed to connect to God as our ultimate source of fuel love, and then that love that God is pouring into us uh, gives us the ability to, com uh, to connect with our parents, our later, our spouses, our children, our neighbors, the least of these. It's all coming from the same fountain, but it has everything to do with our ability to connect. So because connectedness, we were wired by God to connect emotionally to each other. The enemy comes along to find 1,001 ways to disconnect us from our most uh, important human made in the image of God characteristic, which is mm. connectedness. Look around. We said yesterday people are dying sooner, early, prematurely, because they are lonely. Now put those two together. Do you see the connection? God wants you to love. The and enemy connect. destroys your ability to love. And connect. You end up disconnected. You end up lonely. And you end up basically isolated. And nowadays, counties in the United States are saying there is an epidemic, there is a crisis in our society. People are too lonely. So I started telling you about San Mateo County in San Francisco yesterday. You know what they are doing? They are using the, uh, all the um, social, social media platforms, and they are inviting people to come out. They are saying things like, okay, San Mateo County residents, tomorrow at 3 o'clock, we're going to go to this park. And then they say, just, just come over, come out. Even if it's just half an hour, come out and meet your neighbors. And guess what's happening? People are coming out because people are lonely. And people are coming and relating to others and connecting with others. And they are bringing fruits. They are bringing some, you know. Games, sports. Uh, haystacks. <laughs> <laughs> Since we were talking about haystacks earlier. Anyhow, so that's what they are doing, inviting people to come out. Just They are connect. saying, okay, d d don't leave your phone behind. Don't, don't leave this, uh, you know, this uh, gadget nice. behind. Bring it with you, but come out and be present and connect with other people's people live. That's, that's what's happening nowadays. Because Satan is winning the war, and if we don't do something about it, we might fall, fall press of his, or, or, or victims of his uh, uh, attacks. So we're here to tell you that we all have emotional problems. Oops. Did I say that just some of us have emotional problems, my dear family in Wisconsin? All of us have been touched by generations and generations and generations of sin, 
which has resulted in relational emotional problems that we all experience, whether we identify them or, or not. Let's read this together, please. Yeah, let's read it together. Shall we? When we are not, and I can hardly hear you, so let's try a little harder. When we are not able to see our worth through the eyes of our caretakers, or if we experience their dark emotions and responses towards us, we will experience rejection and abandonment, and healthy emotional development will be arrested, it will be stunted, it will be stopped. And I am one of those adults that I have a certain chronological age as a adult woman, but on the inside, in many ways, I am still a stunted and arrested little girl due to the fact that my emotional development was stunted, and I'm on my journey of growth and maturity, and I'm happy to say that by God's grace, I'm on that journey. Every day, I feel a little bit more mature, <laughs> and pretty soon, before I know it, I think my emotional age will actually maybe possibly catch up to my chronological age, although I love feeling a lot younger than I am <laughs> on the inside. Feels good. <laughs> so take note of those two words. Rejection and abandonment. Can you see Jesus rejecting people? Because that's the enemy's work. The enemy rejects. That's why we as Christians cannot afford to reject anybody. Doesn't matter who they are. Jesus did not send us to reject anybody. Because people for the most part, have already been rejected by somebody in their lives. Because remember, Satan is working against you and your mental health. Read with me. Our families are where we learn about what? Ourselves. Our core identity comes first from what? The mirroring eyes of the primary caretakers. So when your primary caretakers saw you, looked at you, what did you see in their eyes? Love, you were blessed, if that's what you saw. Yeah. But some of us may have seen wrath. Anxiety. Disgust. Depression. Anger. Impatience. Rejection. Intolerance. And all this basically is what is creating our mental health. And it's giving us the ability for us to either have the ability to love or, or completely lose it. So it's interesting to note that many well-intended Christian parents, Christian or secular, it doesn't matter. I mean, in, if in, in terms of this, this case in point, but well-intended parents can abandon their children in the following ways. Through physical desertion. That could be that through means death, they die or there is a divorce. Or there's a divorce. Through emotional abandonment, we'll talk a little bit more about that, which means that their busy. parents are at home, maybe, mm -hmm. but they're so overwhelmed with their work, with their own marriage issues, with the care possibly of a special needs child. For whatever reason, there's emotional abandonment. The third one, the third way well-intended parents abandon their children is through touch and affection deprivation. I don't want you to raise your hands, but if I were to ask this morning, how many of you received at least one hug and one kiss from your parents every day? Don't show me your hands. This is a personal question I want you to ask. We have been... How about enough love? Enough affection. Enough, affection. enough. That would be a better way of asking that, I suppose. Yeah. But or I felt know that you received enough affection. Yeah. Because yes. we kind of have a feeling, a sense if whether or not we enough. received enough affection. Except that when we've received very little, we have no idea about that deprivation. So a lot of us grew up with not enough. The, we didn't hear the words, I love you. I am so glad that God may, gave me the joy of being your mom. Of all the kids in the world, he gave me you. 
those kinds of words a lot of us did not receive as children. Our parents were well-intended, but overwhelmed and busy trying to survive their own lives. Another way that we are abandoned is through narcissistic deprivation, meaning we might have had a parent who was very self-focused due to his or her own emotional trauma and didn't want to be this way, but simply were self-focused and didn't have the ability to give us what we needed. Or the, uh, another way is through the neglect of developmental dependency needs. Again, these are well-intended parents that due to their own emotional trauma are not able to meet the needs of their children because their own needs were not met. So they have no idea how to meet their children's needs. And then, of course, all forms of abuse that many of us endured, physical, emotional, verbal, mental, sexual, spiritual, if we have suffered any form of abuse in our childhood, we have experienced abandonment. And, and, and abandonment leaves an imprint on our souls that really changes the way we are in marriage our ability to connect emotionally as a married couple, and it also affects the way we parent our own children. Why don't you illustrate to us a little bit these points? Uh, would you show us what phase do you, do you, or what are your emotions, or what do your eyes say when you look at Sunny? Oh. I don't have enough minutes Tell to talk about Sunny. Sunny, Sunny Bear is our, <laughs> one of our, our, our rescue dog. And, um, well, we don't have time, but I, I could go on okay. and on. Sunny is... Because see, some of us have never experienced that experience. Okay, so, well, yeah, yeah. Okay, Dr. Uh, Abraham, come over here just for a second. I just want you to... So let's just imagine that you're my son, okay? okay. And you could have been my son anyhow, okay? <laughs> so... so uh, any child and every child should experience this when he is looked upon by the primary caregivers. <gasps> I love you so much. You're such a special child for, to me. I'm so excited to have you around. Now, believe it, because I'm, I'm still feeling it, okay? Yeah. So you have to feel it with me, okay? Sure. You cannot keep looking at the, the trees. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you get the point? Some of us never went through that experience. Not even once. <gasps> You're so special. I love you so much. That's called deprivation, basically. Not having received Thank you. Thank you. any Thank of that or very little of that. And so, the third point that we're going to touch before we get into an, a test, because today we're going to give you a test. That is the goal for today's presentation. We're going to give you a test. So before we go there, this is the last thing that we want you to keep in mind as you take the test. So childhood emotional neglect is, we're going to highlight it because we often talk about, and we will in the test that's about to come, and it will actually mention childhood emotional neglect. But it's actually, those are the sins of omission, the things that we didn't receive that we needed to have received. It's what happens when throughout our childhood, our parents fail to respond enough to our emotional needs, mm -hmm. even when they have been loving and well-intended, right? And then, and then the next question people will ask us is, well, what's, what's the big deal with childhood emotional neglect? Well, when we become adults and we've been emotionally neglected, we will experience, it'll be difficult for us to really understand how much God values and loves us. We will have a hard time understanding that. We will be able to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, but feel nothing in our heart of God's love. We will know it, but we won't know it. And we will also have a difficult time having self-compassion. And so often the same symptoms that we had in our childhood, in our emotionally neglected childhood, which is poor emotional regulation. We can't control our emotions. We get fly off the handle for very little. Difficulty making friends. This is very important because oftentimes, especially around evangelistic seasons, right? And our pastors say, well, well, church family, it's time to go invite our friends and neighbors and co-workers to come to this series. And what happens? Not much happens. Your heads are nodding. I think you, you, thank you. Thank you for your, I liked your nonverbal. That's exactly what happens. Because many of us don't have friends 
or relatives that are friends, or you know what I'm, you're following what I'm saying. So if difficulty is making friendships, tendency to blame others for our problems. We have a problem taking responsibility for what we need to take responsibility for. We learned that in Eden, of course, um, during Adam and Eve's post-fall dialogue. So, so it's very important to acknowledge why we are the way we are. Number one, it gives us self-compassion. We can be patient with ourselves as we learn to thaw out our hardened hearts that have sometimes gotten hardened through emotional neglect and or abuse. And we can also seek for the healer, right? Eh, we sure can. We know exactly so, what to ask uh, for. We don't want to lose you, but uh, if, in case you would like to know more about whether or you there is some um, trauma in your life, here's a scale, a very simple scale uh, that gives you an idea whether or not there is trauma in your life. So what uh, the scientists are saying that if you have gone through reje rejection, you most likely have experienced trauma at level one. If you have gone uh, or experienced frustration or come from a very frustrated family systems, uh, most likely there's some trauma in your life at level two. So then you just go on, uh, anger, depression, uh, there is emotional blockage in your system, uh, or you yourself feel that you just cannot experience emotions, feelings, so forth and so on, then there's trauma, level five, insensitivity, impulsivity, indecisiveness, anxiety, notice how how tough this gets, it gets worse and worse and worse. So even though the scale is going up, upwards, it doesn't mean that you're getting better. Uh, on the, it's the opposite. The, the scale is going upward, but the, the ability to feel love and experience and ex love and is a little love. harder. Give okay? and receive love. So this is for anybody that you may be questioning, is it, is it possible that there is some trauma in my life? Well, this might give you some answers, some solutions. So how do you know you don't have any trauma in your life? Yeah. Now, this is very important because how the Bible describes an individual that is rather healthy, it's an individual that is able to change his thinking part, patterns. In other words, you're able to ch renew your mind. Remember Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 3? Renew your mind. So if you're a healthy individual, you are able to renew your mind, uh, adjust your behaviors, change things that is, need to be changed, and if things are not working out very well with here, here in this relationship or other relationships, you're able to adjust yourself because you have that ability because you are somehow healthy. Number two, so two we'll run really quickly down the line. So if you have a camera, I would take a picture because this is a really good litmus test. You know that the Holy Spirit is working with you through trauma if you're able to do these 12 things. Number two, in Ephesians 4.25, we can put away lying. If you have no problem with truth-telling, you know that you're getting through Paul your says, trauma processing. Paul says, do not uh, sin, but do not, I mean... <laughs> Get angry, but do not sin. And we can talk more about that later on. Get angry. It's okay to get angry. The problem is, what is it that you're going to be doing with your anger? That is the issue, according to Paul. We'll avoid uh, speaking corrupt, corrupt words, foul language with in any situation when we know that we are working through our trauma. If you are a gracious individual, if you are able to extend grace to others, especially as you speak, then there's some sense of health, healthiness or health uh, spirit in your soul. We can remove bitterness when we, when we have learned how not to harbor bitterness in our hearts. When people hurt and offend us, we are people that are on a healing journey. When we're, we're able, able to, to abstain from evil speaking, gossiping, when we can be kind, tenderhearted, when we, can, when we choose forgiveness instead of being resentful, cutting off relationships with people. So you remove bitterness, bitterness, you're able to remove wrath, you're able to uh, abstain from evil speaking, uh, you can be kind to others, you can be tender-hearted, and you can choose to forgive others. And that last one is the toughest one. In psychotherapy, that's the one that really challenges people's faith and experience, the forgiving others. So there it goes. I don't know how you relate to that, but that, 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 that list is a challenge to me as a person, as an individual. And it is my, my thermometer. It helps me out to see where I am in relationship to my experience with God, my experiences, experiences with myself, and my experience with other individuals. 
So there was right. a study published by Kaiser Permanente and the Center for Disease Control. It ran, ran from 1995 to 1997. Many of you have probably already heard about it. It took place with 17,421 individuals who were, ex were ex ex extremely overweight and they were having lots of medical problems. And as you know, Kaiser Permanente, and I don't even know if Kaiser Permanente exists in this state. Yes or no? No? No. Okay. Anyway, it's an HMO, so they're out, you know, to make kind of make money uh, as a medical service. But they wanted to make sure that they could help uh, morbidly obese people in losing weight. So they they opened up a weight loss clinic. They the the patients started having success. Many of them that had never been able to lose weight started losing weight. These patients were overweight from 100 to 600 pounds, and they didn't even feel that weight was a problem for them in general, except that they had all these complications with their health as a result. Then they Next. hit a problem. Yep. And the problem was the patients stopped coming to the clinic. That had the already people that were weight. losing weight, they completely stopped coming. And Dr. Felitti, that you showed his picture, started wondering, why is it that they are not returning? Why is it that they are not coming? So they decided to set up a team of individual doctors and interviewers to go to these people's homes throughout San Diego County and other areas in California and find out, why is it, why is it that you're not coming anymore? And out of those visits, they came out with 10 questions, or oh, actually. 10 as issues. They, 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 they identified. identified 10 issues, thank you. 10 issues that were very common among all these patients. So out of those issues, they created a test. And they called the test Adverse Childhood Experiences. You perhaps have, you have heard of the test, a, uh, ACE test. Uh, and this test, my friends, became one of the most important studies that have helped us understand why people get sick, why people commit suicide, why people, why people die commit, early, why people die early, why people die of COVID, why people uh, uh, divorce, why people become smokers. So this test became really a, an eye opener to the community, and we're just gonna uh, miss some of these uh, things. However. I'm going to read this, what they found. This is the first shocker that they found with the test. There was a direct link between childhood trauma yep. and adult onset of chronic disease, as well as mental illness, doing time in prison and work issues such as abstinence. Absenteeism. So, perhaps they, uh, yes, so basically, people began to connect Things that happen to you, adverse things that happen to you when you were a child, and things that are happening to you at an old, I mean, old age, as, as, as an as adult, adult, basically. And through your lifespan. Uh, third shocker. More Four. adverse childhood experiences resulted in higher risk of medical, mental, and social problems as an adult. So basically, people with higher numbers, higher results in ACs, high, higher points, they basically experience more sickness, more problems in their health. Um, so we're going to ask you a question today. How many of you had heard of ACE, adverse childhood experiences? Raise your hand. Test. Yep. Good. Some of we you. have some hands. Okay. I'm so excited. How many of you know your score? Because, and we don't, you don't need to say it out loud, but it's important, they say, they're saying now <laughs> that we've made all the connections between emotional health, mental health, relational health, physical health, they're making all these connections, as we were told in the little red books, right, before science has proven it, makes me so excited, when we've known these things years and years before science has been able to prove it, that knowing our A score is as important as knowing your cholesterol score. How many of you know your level of cholesterol? A few more hands. So hopefully, um, as a result, you'll be more curious to keep up with your cholesterol um, number and then also keep in mind what your so ACE we're, score is. We're giving is. you these questions because these questions, how you answer to these questions will determine the quality of your relationships, the quality of your marriage, and the quality of your parenting. And the uh, quality and ability to give love and receive love. And at the end of the day, the quality of your discipleship. 
Right? right? Because we all want to be disciples of Jesus. Right. But guess what? Satan, I said at the beginning, was working with you long before you were even born. And this, is, this was his goal, for you to answer yes, yes, yes to most of these questions. So every time you answer yes to a question that we're going to ask you, Only you give ten. yourself one point. Only ten, ten questions. Ten questions. At the end of the day, you got to end up with at least ten points. No. I mean, mo no more than ten points. Yeah. Uh, you cannot end up with 11 or 12 because there's only 10 questions. So every time you say yes, one point. You say no, zero points. All right? Pray for the personal, test. This is a personal test, a personal number. You don't need to share it with anyone. So Nobody's um, going to be asking you for your score. So just keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, question number one. Uh, oh, but let me just clarify something. When we ask a question, the, the, the answer, the, the question that has been asked could have happened one time or a hundred times during your childhood. There's no given number. Okay? And these questions are related to the time that you were one year old to the time you were 18 years old. Right. That's what we're measuring, one to 18. Correct. All right, here we go. Number, question number question one. Question number one. While you were growing up during your first 18 years of life, did a parent or other adult in the household often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you feel afraid that you might be physically hurt? Yes or no? Key word there is often. Okay? Often. All right. Questions? Okay, question number two. While you were... I'm going to skip the, the blue line because you know, you know that we're asking these questions uh, that comprehend your life between the ages... Zero, one zero to 18. 18. Yeah. So second question, did a parent or other adult in the household often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? Physical abuse. Yes. Were you abused physically? Or no. And some of these things happened to you when you were growing up. And, yes. the, and the key word again is often, right? Yes often. or no. Okay. Question number three. Did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you? Or have you touched their body in a sexual way? Or try to have oral, anal, or vaginal sex with you? As you see, these are very personal questions. Yes. But it's important for you to keep your score mm -hmm. because the, your end score is going to tell you a story. Yes. So keep your score. Yes or no? Any questions? Question All right. number four. Question number four. Did you often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special? Or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other. In other words, a distant family, a cold family, a family that were not there for you, emotionally distant. constipated, as we like to say sometimes. Yes or no? Yes or no? Number five. Question? No. Question number five. Okay. Did you often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you? Or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you, or take you to the doctor if you needed it? And I would add to, and this is not part of the ACE test, but it says drunk or high. Sometimes our parents weren't drunk or high, but maybe just overwhelmed and over busy. And this is about being Neglected again. Mm -hmm. This is physical neglect. Yes or no? Question number six. Were your parents ever separated or divorced? Were your parents ever separated? That means a, year, a week, a day, two days. Well, not a day, but more than a day. Uh, were they ever separated? Three days, a week, three months, a year, three years. Or were, they, were, they, or were they divorced? Yes or no? Number seven. Question number seven. Was your mother or stepmother 
often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her, or sometimes or often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or hit with something hard, or ever repeatedly hit over at least a few minutes, or threatened with a gun or a knife? Yes or no? Domestic abuse, right? Yes or no? Question number eight. Any questions? All right. Did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or who used street drugs? Between 1 to 18, did you live with somebody that was abusing alcohol or drugs? Yes or no? Question, Question number, number nine says, was a household member depressed or mentally ill, or did a household member attempt suicide? This could be parents, siblings, aunt or uncle, or grandparents who lived in our households when we were growing up between the ages of zero and 18. And it could be any type of mental illness. Anything, depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, schizophrenia. Borderline personality, or any one of the personality disorders, schizoid, schizophrenic anything disorder. Anything under the mental health gamma. spectrum. Yes or no? And the very last question, you should have at least, you know, some points. That is if you went through these experiences. And the last question is, did a household member go to prison while you were growing up? Did somebody end up in prison as you were growing up in your home? Ten questions, ten answers. And this is what's called the adverse childhood experiences. Now, what does that number mean? Whatever number you have there, what does it mean? Very significant. We're going to tell we'll you, very significant. Right now. We're going to zip through this so we can complete. So the higher your score, the greater the prevalence of the following. You'll follow them with me quickly here. So the higher your score, the greater the prevalence of alcoholism and alcohol abuse in your life. The higher the prevalence of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, known as COPD. Higher the rate of depression, fetal death, poor quality of life related to health issues, illicit drug use, higher prevalence of, of ischemic heart disease, which is chest pain that often is signaling you've got clogged arteries, higher prevalence of liver disease, poor work performance, financial stress, the list goes on, risk for intimate partner violence, multiple sexual partners, sexually transmitted diseases, smoking, suicide attempts, unintended pregnancies, early initiation of smoking, early initiation of sexual activity, adolescent pregnancy, risk for sexual violence, and poor academic achievement. These are all risks that we have, the higher our ACE score is. And next we're going and to share study, with you. They started to learn that uh, people that have four points or more, they were more prone to having greater risk of hepatitis, 240%. Yeah, yeah, 240%. So, <laughs> so notice the numbers. 390% greater risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, or COPD. Emphysema and or chronic bronchitis as well, any of those lung 240 diseases. 240% greater risk of sexually transmitted diseases. So look at the numbers. Double but the probability of being a smoker. Seven times greater probability of being an alcoholic. Ten times greater probability of having injected street drugs. And 12 times greater. 12 times greater probability of attempting suicide. So if you're you, wondering, uh, I, I'm glad I heard someone say wow, because the statistics are staggering. So are you seeing the connection you, of so how we, Satan... We can see the connection, what Satan, Satan does in our childhood. It destroys you in the childhood years, and how that destruction of your mental health is going to have repercussions, and is going to have implications at the time that you are an adult. By the way, um, yeah, we're just going to continue, because <clears throat> there's so much to say. 
And so people with time. higher A scores mm -hmm. are people that are more likely to be violent. Have more marriages. More broken bones. More drug prescriptions. More depression. More autoimmune diseases. A more work absence. Absences, yeah. Next. Any question? Okay, so um, Craig was uh, talking about stress. How people have the choice to basically uh, fight, fry, or freeze. freeze. Or fawn. And basically, this is what we learn to do when we are facing uh, times of trauma. Uh, we're not going to go into that, but basically, the problem that happens is that when you are facing, he mentioned a bear. <laughs> when you're facing a bear, one time you can survive the trauma. You know, you, you either fly, he was talking about either flying or fighting or freezing, but that's one event. The problem with trauma is when the child suffers that event over and over and over again, then the brain becomes basically thwarted, destroyed. It becomes limited with the functions that it can perform. That's the reason why traumatized children don't do well at school. Mm -hmm. That's why traumatized individuals don't see well, don't read well, don't hear well, don't process well. Our brain is distorted because of our number of A scores in our because system. Because of the lives. high level of cortisol, the stress hormone that infants, even embryos, are beginning to be bathed with the stress hormone cortisol as their parents are experiencing high stress in their relationship. Let's read this together. Let's, let's hear you. Let's read together. The ACE study became even more significant, I cannot hear you, <laughs> with the publication of what? Of parallel research that provided the link between why, listen to this, why something that happened to you when you were a kid would land you what? Where? In, In the, the hospital, hospital at the, at the age, age of 50. Of 50. Wow. Okay. No, wow. this is a hypothesis. I have not tested this. But think about um, COVID. Why subject A gets COVID, subject B gets COVID, one goes to the hospital and comes out. The other one goes into the hospital and doesn't come out. You know what was the connection? Well, what you hypothesized well, well, is no, the but, but medically, the connection is the fact that uh, the lungs of the person that did not come out could not support, could not fight, could not be strong enough to fight COVID. That person basically died. Now, ACE found that people with high scores, they Trauma. basically tend to have weak organs. Especially lungs and liver. Especially lungs. Isn't that Satan's work? Not only destroy your ability to get to heaven, but also give you a misery of experience here on earth. And if he can destroy your body, and, and, and Greg was talking about the, the physical body and the running and the ability to exercise, Satan doesn't want you to do those things. He doesn't want you to have He was saying that if you have those things, you have more ability to be forgiven, you have ability to be more patient, and you can uh, bounce back, have um, resilience. But Satan doesn't want you to do exercises. So when you were a child, he started working against your organs, trying to give you high scores, A scores. So by the time you were 50, you were limited as to how much you could do with your body and your organs. This is going to be really small for them to uh, read. Yeah. We'll go, go quickly. Yeah, so keep going. The, keep going. This is the question. We were talking about bears since this morning. If I were to ask you, who was your bear in your life? Growing up. Who caused Growing stress? Up. Who caused stress in your life? Who caused you to get scared? Who caused you to fight or flight or freeze? What caused for your hormones to, or your body to be filled with cortisol? And, and experience a lot of stress. stress. Remember that the Bible told us, or, yeah, gave us a clue. The thief comes to steal and kill 
and destroy. All his That's work. That's his work. That's his work. But we're not going to leave you with this picture today. We're going to give you hope and a future. Because God says, the plans I have for you are plans for, for you to have a future and for you to have hope. So the Bible says that the time came when a baby was born, and the reason the baby was born was because he needed to come and heal my heart, your heart, and destroy the ACE score in your experiences. Amen. So the Bible says that for this purpose, the Son of Man... Let's read that together. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So, friends, we have good news this morning, so, uh, afternoon. So the gospel <laughs> and Jesus' love... That's right. ...and Jesus' grace for you... Yes. ...is able to turn around the effects of the A's score in your life. Amen. And this is why it's so powerful and wonderful to preach a gospel that is filled with hope and healing, because at the end of the day, everybody has an A's score, and everybody needs to have that A score reversed. And guess what? Jesus says, I can do that for you. I it doesn't matter for that. what the devil has done in your life. Amen. I came to destroy the works of the devil. That's what gets us excited. That's Amen. why a preacher preaches, this, preach, preach, and that's why people go out there and share the power and the love of Jesus, because people need to know I can change my experience. My I heart. can be a different person. I don't have to die early, leaving my kids behind, leaving my wife behind, leaving my grandkids behind. Behind. I don't have to die because my lungs are not strong enough. Because when you accept the gospel, my friends, it doesn't just renew your spirit, it renews your body. Amen, Amen. to that? Amen. Wow, this All is connected. really good news. So the Bible keeps saying, When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters of God. And because you, my friends, have been adopted, redeemed. You and I have the privilege of becoming syringes. I'll go back to the early reference to syringes. The, the storehouse of love is found above. As I connect, as I make a choice, I want to love you, God, more than I loved you yesterday. Today, I want to love you more. And today, I want to open up my life, my brain, my heart, my life to become a syringe and become a healing love medicine to the hurt people around me. So I present you to the traumatizer of trauma. His name is Jesus. He's got the ability to traumatize your trauma. Isn't Amen. that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? The traumatizer of trauma. Amen. And we're going to leave you with our beautiful passages from Ellen G. White, which is our, one of our authors. Keep going, Papa. That's not the one. Oh, that's not it. I have not arrived yet. Uh, There's a lot of them, but we we'll don't have time. Okay, here we go. Nope, nope, nope. Here we go. Nope, nope. This, this is Ellen G. White. No? Yeah, yeah, but oh, you know, want to go? I see. I know where you want to go. I, I'll take you there. there I'll Stop. take you there. I'll take you there. So I, I recommend, I have this um, passage from Ministry of Healing, page 115, in my kitchen, in my bathroom, in my bedroom, and I reread it every morning, and every time I get near one of the one of my um, notes that I have up on my wall. And if you're able to read it, um, read it with me. And it says, the love of Christ, I'm telling you, this is medicine. The love of Christ diffuses through the whole being, which, oh, sorry, I did, I misread it. The love which Christ is a vitalizing power. Every vital part, read along with me, the brain, the heart, the nerves, it touches with healing. What touches with healing? The love of Christ. The love which Christ diffuses, right? By its highest energies of the, of, of the being, 
By it, sorry, the highest energies of the being are aroused to activity. It frees the soul from guilt and sorrow, the anxiety and care that crush the life forces. Stop, Caroline. Where are the men? Men, raise your hands. Men, read with me. With it, come what? You're about the middle of the page. Men, yep. serenity. And what is uncomposure? It implants in the soul what men? Joy. joy that nothing earthly can destroy. Girls, women, please. Joy with my wife. in the Holy Spirit, health giving, life giving joy, friends. I invite you to stand before we have our final prayer, but we just want to really remind each other today that joy, joy, spirit, driven joy is contagious. And when we are not just Christians with a lot of head knowledge, but we have chosen to connect to the source of Christ's healing love, we have said, Lord, please heal my mind, my brain, my heart, my nervous system. I want to have composure. I want to experience a happy countenance. I want to be full of joy, my friends. Joy is contagious. Our world is crumbling under the weight of Satan's lies. They're looking for joy in all the wrong places. They're looking for it as they get high. And then what's happening is they can't get enough of the drug. And so many of them, one of my relatives just, uh, well, through marriage, uh, was trying to medicate his severe anxiety, this handsome young boy, loved his parents, had a girlfriend. It couldn't, ha he, he overdosed looking to find relief from anxiety, joy. And Jesus is telling us, connect to me and let me be the healing bomb, bomb of Gilead for all of the wounds that may have caused you to have a difficult time expressing love and affection to yourself, <laughs> to others, and friends, when we understand that this is at the heart of the good news gospel, Jesus did more healing than preaching. than preaching. And many of us need to learn a lesson from Jesus. We want our, our adult children and grandchildren to come back to Jesus, so we do a lot of preaching. You know, you're doing the wrong thing, Peter. Susan, you got to cut that out. You got to dress differently. You got to take off those tats. And I think that... Jesus was trying to show us all along, he is the healing bomb. And Jesus is not a religion. Jesus is a relationship. Repeat that with me. Jesus is not a religion. Jesus is not a religion. Jesus is a Jesus is a relationship. And that it brings, is our prayer that, that brings, brings salvation, salvation healing, healing, restoration, redemption, and restoration. Friends, what a deal we have in Jesus. I finish with this. Going back to my friend Craig this morning. One angel says, that's true, you need healing. Mm. Go to Jesus. An angel, other angel says, you don't need healing. You got your 28 fundamental beliefs. You've been an Adventist forever. You're good. Which, which one is it going to be? Amen. Glory to God. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, it's a joy and a privilege to be able to call ourselves, identify ourselves as adopted, redeemed, healed, beloved children of yours. You know what's weighing heavy on our hearts this morning. Would you come and touch those hurting areas would you come and take our anxieties and concerns as we deposit them and release them to you? Amen. And would you bring healing, your healing yes. love, into our lives first so that we can become contagious, Christ-reflecting healing agents in our families first and in our communities that are so desperately hurting today. So we are standing before you broken. Mm -hmm. 
Perhaps we don't even know how broken we are. But we ask that the Holy Spirit will pay us a visit and help us understand how broken we are. Because it seems that everybody knows that we are broken except ourselves. Mm. Or maybe we know that we're so broken that we don't think that we deserve God's love. Mm. Whatever the case is, we need salvation. We need Jesus. We need healing. We need restoration. We need redemption. If anybody needs to be redeemed this morning, it is us. It is me this morning. We are the sinful, most sinful human being on earth. We are the ones that are capable of even doing the most horrendous things because that's just us. We're evil. However, through Jesus, we can be completely a different person, somebody that you can call your child your son, your daughter. And we praise you for that power and for that salvation and for the glory of the hope that we have in Jesus. Bless us today. Heal us today. That is our prayer. Amen.